Hi, I'm Bill Patrick. The program you're about to see is part of a vintage series called Car and Track, which was originally produced during the first half of the 1970s. Before we begin the show, though, a brief program note. Using as many as eight cameras to shoot a single event, Car and Track captured some of the great NASCAR competitions of the era, one race at a time. Over the course of some 80 episodes through six seasons, series producer and host Bud Lindemann lovingly documented a unique era in American motor racing. While the race action contained in the series remains timeless, the program itself has not dated quite so gracefully. Although the years have not been overly kind to Bud's decidedly low-key introductions and interviews, we believe them to be an integral part of this one-of-a-kind series. So please, stay with us now as Speed Vision presents a rare slice of 1970s Americana, Car and Track. like to welcome you back to the car and track scene. We got a lot of ground to cover today. First off, the entire southeast on the NASCAR racing circuit and a trackside look at a champion. A trip to Los Angeles, California, and a couple of tips that may save your life in a crisis situation. And that's demonstrated by our guest, James Garner. Then down to Daytona Beach, Florida, where we met our road test car of the week, the 71 Dodge Challenger, a muscle car that'll give you all the action you're looking for. We'll be back, ready to go, right after this. 383 cubic inches, fed by a four-barrel carburetor. And all the action up here is funneled to the rear wheels via a four-speed manual transmission. Now, if you think this 1970-watt Dodge Challenger is hot, <laughs> you're right. But it offers more than just a pile of muscle. The Dodge boys put a lot of engineering know-how into this one. And it paid off in just about every department. Our driver twisted this Challenger every way but loose. And it looked like this. Tight money and insurance premiums that are out of sight, the curtain could be falling on the supercar era. But nonetheless, they're still pure fun. And this Dodge Challenger has to be a top contender for Pony Car of the Year. It looks an awfully lot like last year's model. But then, what's wrong with that? In most Pony Cars, this 383 engine would cause heavy characteristics in the nose. But the Challenger is built to match the output of the bigger engines. In fact, with the 340 engine up front, the handling difference is hardly noticeable. When we brought our pony up to the line, it was happy time. And our speedometer found 30 miles an hour in 2.8 seconds. That Hurst shifter was so smooth, we thought it was mounted in butter. On our second run, we nailed 45 in 4.7. We popped the clutch on our third time out of the hole. Those big rubber donuts bit hard into the asphalt, and that eight piston screamer had us to 70 miles an hour in eight seconds flat. Our best shift point was around 5,600 RPM. The car not only came out of the hole like its tail was on fire, but it negotiated the pylon course with comparative ease. After the first run, we shortened the distance between the cones by 10 feet and the Challenger still pushed through at 50 miles an hour. Rebound, as well as recovery, were excellent. Braking in our test car left quite a bit to be desired. At 30 miles an hour, it took 49 feet to stop.
We had power-assisted discs up front with 10-inch drums in the rear. From 50 miles an hour, it took 86 feet to grind to a halt. The brakes pull to the right, and noticeably so on high-speed stops. After five consecutive 70-mile-an-hour panic stops, heat buildup was intense. The pedal faded. This stop took 211 feet. What it lacked in the braking department, it made up in cornering. This little pony was beautiful in the turn. Our driver ran it hard and deep into the pocket. And with that 383 cubic inch up front, he brought it through in a four-wheel drift with power on. This pony twisted through the corners on unequal length hay arms, longitudinal torsion bars, tubular shocks, and an anti-sway bar. In high-speed turns and with all the slack out of the suspension, body lean was excessive, but it didn't affect roadability. The 71 Challenger is one of the best pony cars we've tackled yet. Changes on the surface were few. However, underneath, there were several, and all for the best. Santa Ana, California, and tricky Orange County Raceway. It's the home of Bob Bondurant's famous high-performance driving school. You know, race drivers are made, not born. And here's where it happens. But Bob's school also offers an excellent defensive driving course. And things on the road being what they are, we figured we could all use a lesson in emergency driving. And we were lucky enough to find a very qualified pupil to take the wheel for our lesson. Movie star and car buff James Garner. So here's Garner, Bondurant, and car and track in a driving lesson for all of us. Today's emergency driving lesson is going to be based around freeway driving and accident prevention. Um, on the board here, I have an accident simulator layout drawn out that we use in the uh, driving school all the time. Uh, explain this for you. These are three traffic lights here. This represents three lanes of traffic on the freeway. Uh, 88 feet from the lights uh, is a timing light device. All of this is controlled by my control box off here on the left-hand side. Now, the 88 feet relationship here at 60 miles per hour gives you one second to think and react to the situation. At 30 miles an hour, you have two seconds. A little easier. Start you out easy so you don't crash in the first run. Now we test Jim's skill, avoiding the simulated freeway accident by changing lanes without using brakes. The object, drive around the accident area in the clear lane. After the initial practice runs, we asked Jim about this test. For someone who hasn't seen it, it's very interesting to watch. I think, you know, the first couple of times through, you don't know what to expect. But th that's uh, very good for normal driving. You don't know what to expect when you have an accident. Suddenly, 30 miles an hour seems faster than usual. Through the entry lane, the electric eye registers, the red light blinks, it's green in the right lane. Cross the 88 feet in two seconds, he's through the clear lane and with no pylons down. The red light signaled an accident in the left lane. With that move, Jim could have changed lanes safely in any freeway situation. Now our celebrity driver rolls back to the start line for his second run. This one, a little bit tougher. Forty miles an hour, and the tension builds. Which lane will it be? The light changes. It's the left lane. This time, Jim cuts hard. He's through him clean. Uh-oh. No, sir. The officials check it, and there's two pylons down. Jim's not happy about that, and he pinpoints the problem. As your speed increases, you're going closer to the point where you have to turn, and your time diminishes. Now, with the control panel preset, the lanes are cleared for Jim Garner's next run. Bondurant says this is the impossible one. 60 miles an hour, one second to react, and remember, no brakes allowed. The O's fires through the entry lane and hurdles into the challenge of the flashing lights. Jim snaps the wheel and the cutlass slashes hard to the right. Too hard. On the freeway, that would have been someone's fender. So, how fast is too fast? Well, I think it's uh, I think it's very important that people understand their own car and what it will do. 
and drive within that capability of their car and themselves. This is a good test of what you and your car will do. I think it's a good test. According to the National Safety Council, when a clear lane escape route is available, use it and avoid freeway accidents. NASCAR's Grand National Championship Series begins in January at Riverside, California. The opener draws the top names in racing. Indy winners like A.J. Foyt and Parnelli Jones, road racer Dan Gurney, and the full NASCAR fraternity. But when the dust settles after the 1969 race, the man in victory lane is Richard Petty, giving Ford a seventh consecutive Riverside victory. The series then returns to the ovals for a 12-month, 54-race seesaw battle on everything from half-mile dirt tracks to two-and-a-half-mile super speedways. On the big tracks, the Fords and Mercuries dominate, taking 13 of 15 super speedway clashes. At Daytona in February, Charlie Glotzbach leads going into the final lap. He is followed by Leroy Yarbrough in the white number 98 Ford. 100,000 people come to their feet as the cars enter the last turn. Roy Yarborough wins the Daytona 500 by inches and begins a string of major victories unparalleled in the history of the sport. Cale Yarborough's Mercury Cyclone is first at Atlanta. Then it's Leroy again with back-to-back -back victories at Darlington and at Charlotte. Cale edges him on the last lap at Michigan International Speedway. But Leroy returns to make it two in a row at Daytona. And Donnie Allison on October 12th at Charlotte clinches the seventh consecutive manufacturer's championship for Ford. As the season draws to a close, Leroy has captured an unprecedented six super speedway victories. He will go on to be named Ford's Motorsports Man of the Year, an honor shared in past seasons by drivers such as A.J. Foyt, Mario Andretti, and Cale Yarbrough. But while Leroy's number 98 Ford was the car most often in victory lane on the big tracks, the driver's championship was being contested between Richard Petty and defending grand national champion David Pearson. For these two men, the season is still very much alive. pressure on me. Uh, these last few races, I feel like there's more pressure on me than normally. And if I was to fall out real early, I could lose the championship, but I could also sew the championship up here at this race. On October 26th in Rockingham, North Carolina, David Pearson and Richard Petty will settle their long conflict of 1969. Well, the championship is pretty important, really. I've won it two years in 64 and 67 and uh, there was four or five of us I think has won a championship twice and my father's the only one so far that won it three times and uh, David Pearson myself is the only one to have a chance right now being the, the second one to run it three times. Richard Betty is one of the toughest drivers for running on the tracks today. He's good on the short tracks, dirt tracks, super speedways. He's one of the tops. Well, I would say that David Pearson is probably one of the best Grand National drivers we have. He's won enough races on all kinds of tracks. The Speedway is a question mark. It has been remodeled into the fastest one-mile circuit in the world, but during practice, several drivers have crashed, most of them in turn two. The effect on tires of 500 blistering miles remains an unknown factor, but the tire companies are mounting 20 right-side tires and 10 left-side tires for the faster cars, and they are offering no guarantees. They're on the edge all the time, really. They're beyond my edge, maybe beyond your edge. They know where this edge is, and they'll try it just to see, and once in a while, it gets to them, and they, they fail. They go beyond their own edge. Yarbrough is among those who crash during qualifying, yet even in his backup car, he sets a world's record for the mile oval. He remains the man to beat. I've never been a loser in automobile racing since I first started. The main objective that I had, regardless of what kind of racing I was doing, was to win. And wanting to beat the other guy is just the biggest thing imaginable in your mind. Starting in seventh position, in a 1969 Ford, from Landowman, North Carolina, car number 43, Richard Petty. Starting in the second row, in fourth position, car number 17, a young man who is the reigning Grand National Champion, driving a 69 Ford from Spartanburg, North Carolina. Two and in their cause, immediately praise. 
Well, you get tensed a little bit when they say, you know, I can't answer. And the biggest thing is just waiting around, waiting, getting ready to start. Of course, while I'm racing, I choose them to keep my mouth moist. Pearson are running seventh and ninth, watching each other and both watching the rough pavement on turn two. With the leaders turning laps of 137 miles an hour, how long will their tires take the punishment? The answer comes on lap 20. quite extensively and immediately the junior johnson crew just jumped right in there and straightened the sheet metal out got some new tires back on it and got me able to run again and i don't think i lost but maybe one lap 100 miles into the race the dodgers of bobby isaac and buddy baker are running one two but richard and david have begun their charge now there is no holding back no watching each other now they are flat out by lap 110 they are running one two for the champion Petty has left a wheel and tire embedded in the wall of turn two. As the Petty crew works frantically to straighten the twisted sheet metal, David Pearson moves into the lead. But the impact was too great. The repairs will not hold. must beat Petty. Now he must beat the track. Allison has the wind knocked out of him, but is unhurt. In an hour, he will return to the pits as a spectator. On lap 168, Cale Yarborough is leading. Becomes a matter of survival now. James Hilton, Bobby Isaac, Bobby Johns, and Buddy Young. 
Charlie Glatzbach. Now David Pearson and Leroy Yarborough, the leading money winners of the 69 season, have at each other. With Petty out, Pearson doesn't need to win this race to remain champion. But as long as the race is there to be won, he will try to win it. David wanted to win the race, and I wanted to win the race. And the way that we go about doing this, I guess, is just run one another hard enough to break. It was pretty evident we weren't going to slow down regardless of what we got on our pit boards and all. Now Leroy Yarbrough comes to the inside to David Pearson. He's trying to get around him. They've got some traffic in the first turn. He comes back into the pile. Leroy Yarbrough and David Pearson side by side. But Pearson's engine has developed a misfire. It is over. Yarborough takes the checkered flag. Pearson is second on seven cylinders. 17 of 40 cars finish the race. photographers in Victory Lane and to the surrounding fans, the center of attention is Leroy Yarborough, whose seven major victories nearly doubled the previous record. When you're out there alone at 175 or 200 miles an hour, it just goes without words. If you think enough of it to do it, then you should think enough of it to be the best. But in the press tower, the reporters who cover United States auto racing also await the arrival of NASCAR's grand national champion. Well, when I first started, I didn't think I would ever become a champion. Of course, I always wanted to. This time winning the championship, it means quite a bit to me because when I first started, I knew it was a hard road to travel. And in fact, my first race, I think I won about $13 in it. And so I feel like if I won the championship against the guys I'm running against now, I've done a good job. A season closes. But they will be back next year. Those who watch, those who drive. There is a unique bond among people who are drawn to the staccato violence of an open exhaust. It is an understanding that the spectacle, framed by green and checkered flags, is more than a contest of men and machines. To drive very fast and to win challenges a man to seek his own limitations, his own edge, as well as those of his opponents. In reaching for those limitations, it has been said that if you have the time, the talent, and the inclination. Every Sunday, you can live for a hundred years. Well, that's it. If you dig this automotive scene, I hope you'll plan to join us every week at this time. We'll cover the top racing events in the nation, along with honest, factual road tests that may help you decide on your next garage full. Motorsports, testing, experimentals, safety, design. You'll see it all right here on Car and Track. Till next week, this is Bud Lindemann reminding you to drive carefully. All the pros do. And bye-bye.